Nathan Chandra Kasan from Emory University. And this event is co-hosted by David Hagen from University of Seattle and Joyce Q from uh, University of Columbia. Um, this CAS webinar is co-sponsored by, as you all know, Clinical Immunology Society and Latin American Society of Immune Deficiency. Just to remind you of the format, we have the uh, first 10 minutes is dedicated to recent literature review. And uh, we will have 25 minutes each for both the cases. And we have two very interesting cases today. One is going to be discussed by Anu from Emory University. And another one would be discussed by um, Chong um, uh, from Brazil. So we are excited to have amongst us uh, Professor Gigi Natalangelo from Harvard, uh, the current president of Clinical Immunology Society, as one of our senior mentors. And we also have another president from Latin American Society of Immune Deficiency, Professor um, Condino. We are still trying to have him online. Hopefully, by the beginning of the second case, we would have him. So before I start, I think I want to remind the audience that um, audience participation is key for this. So uh, if you can look to your left bottom, uh, there is a chat box. So we would appreciate if you can post your comments, questions as we discuss this case, as we go through this case. So um, without wasting much time, I would hand over to Eshim to do the literature review from recent um, uh, edition of Journal of Clinical Immunology. Go ahead, Ashim. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, hello, everyone. Um, I am going to try to review three articles from the last uh, Journal of Clinical Immunology. So, the first article is on uh, ADA2 deficiency. Uh, so ADA2 is uh, released by monocytes, macrophages, and dendritic cells, and it is considered to help bridging cells during the immunologic synapse formation. Uh, deficiency of adenosine DMNase 2, DADA2, um, has been described before in 54 patients, and it is mainly associated with vasculopathy and early onset stroke. Uh, so some of these patients also had hypogamma globulinemia. Uh, still, uh, we don't know the pathogenesis of the immunodeficiency uh, and uh, early onset uh, stroke or vasculopathy. So in this paper, they uh, reported a family of um, two, uh, two healthy parents, two affected children, and one affected child, and they studied uh, whole exome sequencing. So index patient was a 32-year-old man. Uh, he presented at age 18 years. He had recurrent respiratory tract infections, mouth ulcers, intermittent uh, joint pains, asthma, chronic diarrhea, splenomegaly, but he didn't have any evidence of vasculitis. His labs revealed undetectable IgA deficiency. He had low IgG subclasses. Uh, these were at age 19 years, and then he subsequently developed very low IgG levels. Uh, low switch memory B cells and very low T cells. Uh, he had no vaccine response. Uh, he was diagnosed with uh, CVID and placed on IVIG. His sister, uh, on the other hand, um, had a totally different picture uh, with um, uh, two, um, at two years of age. He started with skin lesions, erythema nodosum-like skin lesions, uh, recurrent UTIs, congenital hydronephrosis. She did have splenomegaly, micro, microstic anemia, recurrent fevers, and arthritis. Uh, she had some infections, streptococcal pharyngitis mainly. Uh, she had interstitial nephritis. Uh, and I, uh, this paper also showed the first uh, kidney uh, pathology findings uh, of this condition. Uh, and then she later developed hypogam. Uh, she had uh, splenectomy. Unfortunately, she expired three months after uh, with cerebral bleeding and multi-organ failure. And the cultures grew candida and pseudomonas. So whole exome sequencing in this family showed two-point mutations in CECR1, which encodes ADA2. And the, uh, the two affected patients were compound heterozygotes, and unaffected members were heterozygous. So the authors concluded that uh, DADA2 can present clinically as CVID or atypical SLE. Um, and uh, antibody deficiencies and immune dysregulation syndrome should be put on the possible spectrum of DADA2. Uh, 
uh, and then measuring called ADA2 activity because they measured this activity in the dry bl uh, blood uh, spot uh, in the index case and it was significantly diminished. They say this test may be a good test as a rapid and reliable test for diagnosis, diagnosis of this condition. They also recommend screening CVID patients who also have vasculitis for this condition. So the second paper is about CAR9 deficiency. This is uh, also in a family with uh, chronic and fun uh, invasive fungal infections. So CAR9 is a very important molecule uh, and then plays a role in recognition of fungus. Uh, and an activation card, uh, CAR9 in the down, um, uh, downstream pathway, so uh, it results in T cell differentiation into IL-17 uh, producing T cells. Uh, so it has been shown in patients with uh, chronic and severe uh, fungal infections uh, in the past. Um, and then um, the uh, paper also um, review uh, main genetic causes of chronic mucocutaneous candidiasis. Those are IL-17F, IL-17RA, RC, ACT1, and uh, gain of function mutation of STAT1. So in this paper, they uh, studied a family. This was a Turkish family, a uh, consanguinous family. Uh, the index case was 55-year-old man. He, was, um, he had a chronic cutaneous dermatophytosis since age 8 years, and then he later developed oral candidiasis and onychomycosis. He married to his second cousin, and they had two affected sons. Uh, his, also, his grandmother suffered from chronic dermatophytosis. So the first uh, son presented with a chronic mucocutaneous candidiasis at age 8. The second son developed a, a CMC at age 5. Uh, then he also developed hypoparathyroidism and onychomycosis, and then uh, later candida encephalitis. Uh, which was treated successfully. So in terms of immunologic findings, um, the index case had high IgE and eosinophilia. So it was initially thought that maybe this case was a hyper-IG syndrome, but the, the NIH score uh, was only 12. Um, uh, other than this, uh, the immunologic evaluation in, the, in this family was uh, um, um, not very uh, significant, except two sons had the mitogen proliferation study to Canada, and they were defective. And uh, the, the authors um, uh, sequenced the CAR9 uh, gene, and then uh, it showed homozygous missense mutation, which is uh, called R70W. Uh, this mutation has been shown in Turkish families with CAR9 deficiency. So the authors concluded that uh, one specific mutation, R70W, can lead to distinct clin clinical phenotypes uh, such as isolated CMC, treatment resistant cutaneous dermatophytosis, invasive dermatophytosis, candida encephalitis, endocrinopathy, or combination of these conditions. And they suggest that patients with recurrent and or invasive fungal infections in the absence of known immunodeficiencies should be tested for CAR9 mutations. And the third, third paper uh, is uh, something we all, uh, always see in the clinic. Uh, so this, is, uh, this paper um, is about secondary antibody deficiency uh, due to glucocorticoid treatment. And they, uh, they found that this is, uh, their uh, immunologic findings are different from the primary immune deficiencies. So, uh, so as we know, gl uh, glucocorticoid steroids uh, are may widely used in chronic inflammation, autoimmune disease, and they, they do suppress uh, humoral and cellular immunity. And uh, we know that uh, many primary immune deficiencies may present with autoimmune conditions, and they are treated with steroids, and then... Uh, uh, and then they, uh, when they develop hypogamma globulinemia, we have to find out if it is primary or secondary because this changes the management and prognosis. So the authors uh, aim to identify the characteristics of hypogamma globulinemia secondary to steroid treatment and uh, to find out uh, if, it is, uh, if they, uh, they are value in the differential diagnosis of uh, to primary antibody deficiency. So they studied uh, 36 patients, uh, 22 had giant cell arteritis, uh, GCA, and 14 had polymyalgia aromatica, PMR, 
and they studied the gender and age match controls, uh, and they looked at uh, the patient's immunoglobulin levels, T cell and B cell subsets. So all patients have received uh, steroid treatment, um, and uh, the, the duration was from 0 0.1 month to 147 months. The dose was from um, from 0 to 50 milligrams. Uh, and uh, what they uh, and then some patients were on methotrexate also. So what they found is point prevalence of hypogen was 33% in patients versus 6% in controls. Uh, a sustained IgG reduction for at least six months was seen in eight patients. Uh, all patients with IgG level below five gram uh, did not recover normal levels during the observation period. In addition to low IgG, uh, uh, IgA and IgM were reduced in two and four patients. Uh, and then interestingly, there was no correlation of IgG levels to cumulative dose or duration of the glucocorticoid treatment or the additional use of methotrexate. So uh, very quickly, um, all patients uh, who were treated with steroids had low ALCs absolute lymphocyte counts. They had low B cells and T cells. And the B cell subsets, they, uh, they show that um, uh, transitional and naive B cells were low, significantly low. But the class which uh, memory B cells and preserve, uh, IgM memory B cells were preserved, uh, and then these were different from CVID phenotype. Uh, in terms of T cell subsets, uh, they uh, showed um, uh, reduced CD4 T cells and uh, regulatory T cells, uh, and then CD4 naive and uh, recent timic emigrants were not different uh, from the control. Uh, in addition to that, there were no significant differences in regard to B, cell, B and T cell subsets with, between patients with sustained, transient, or no hypogammaglobulinemia. And also, there was no correlation between serum immunoglobulin levels and B and T cell subsets. So the conclusion was uh, antibody deficiency, primarily IgG deficiency, occurs in more than 50% of patients with GCA or PMR who have been on glucocorticoid treatment. And it is persistent in about 50% of affected patients, uh, especially in patients whose IgG levels dropped below 5 grams mm -hmm. per liter. Extensive drops in IgG level are seen during the initial high dose in the first couple of weeks, and they recommend checking the levels at the end of this phase. Uh, they suggest prospective studies to address the infection risk because they didn't evaluate really the infections in these patients. And they, uh, the main um, um, uh, point in this uh, paper was uh, there was a difference in terms of the B cell phenotype and immunoglobulin phenotype from uh, CVID, uh, which was um, isolated IgG deficiency, normal IgA levels, preserved switch memory B cells were characteristics in these groups. So this concludes the uh, literature review for this month. Thank you. Thank Any you, Hisham. Mm -hmm. Thanks. So we'll move on to our next case. Um, so it will be presented by Anu from Emory University. Um, go ahead, Anu. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Anu, and I'm one of the fellows at Emory. I wanted to start off by thanking CIS for giving me the opportunity to present today. Our case tonight is about a 14-year-old female. She was diagnosed with neutropenia at nine months of age. She had several infections in infancy, including persistent perirectal abscesses, pneumonia, and GI viruses. She initially had normal growth parameters documented at 10 months of age, but then dropped off the growth chart at some point shortly after. At the age of two, she was diagnosed with a protein-losing enteropathy. She was found to have hypogammaglobulinemia and lymphopenia, and IVIG and potamidine prophylaxis were initiated. At four years of age, she was diagnosed with schwachmann diamond syndrome, which is an autosomal recessive disease. Her diagnosis was based on neutropenia, recurrent infections, presumed pancreatic insufficiency, and short stature, which are all common features of this syndrome. She did not have any of the skeletal abnormalities, though, related to short stature that you would typically see with schwachmann diamond and she only had one SPDS mutation, 
but nevertheless, she still carried the diagnosis because her clinical picture was thought to be fairly consistent with it. In the years following, she continued with recurrent diarrhea, multiple febrile illnesses, numerous hospitalizations for central line infections, and minimal growth in both weight and height. Uh, she ultimately became dependent on TPN for nutrition. And one thing to note with her is she did receive care at multiple institutions in various states, which did disrupt uh, continuity for her. In regards to other medical and surgical history, she was diagnosed with hypothyroidism early in life and she had intussusception and is now status post partial small bowel resection at the age of three. Her family history was unremarkable. Her physical <laughs> exam was most notable for her size. As you can see from the growth chart, her weight and height parameters both way below the first percentile for age. We do see a recent bump in growth, and that's when TPN was initiated last year on a more continuous basis. She also has numerous erythematous scaly skin lesions, which you can see from these pictures of her arm and her scalp. Lastly, she was also found to have hepatosplenomegaly. And aside from these things, her exam was pretty much within normal limits. In regards to her workup, she continued to be lymphopenic with a recent ALC of 565. Of note, her neutropenia had resolved by the age of three. She was found to have intermittent low-grade EBV titers. Renal biopsy revealed focal segmental glomerulosclerosis, and CT chest showed bilateral bronchiectasis. So at this okay. point, given her complicated history, oh, sorry, and that she had several features that didn't really fit Schwachmann Diamond alone, uh, further workup was pursued. So for the audience, do you have any specific questions, comments on this case thus far? Okay, I think we can go with the immunology uh, testing, then get back to the audience. Okay, sure. So in regards to immune studies, we see that she's overall lymphopenic with hardly any B cells, but normal NK cells. T cell phenotyping showed basically absent CD4 and CD8 naive cells. We can see that summing up her naive central and effector cells is far from 100%. And although we don't have the exact numbers, we can speculate that the rest of the cells not recorded, in particular for CD8, represent exhausted memory T cells, which are expanded in chronic viral infections like EBV, which she did have. In regards to her mitogen studies, she had mildly decreased her lift response to PHA. Her immunoglobulin levels were normal at one year of age, and recheck at eight years of age showed low IgG and IgA when normal IgM and IgE. I know. Before you before you continue, it's an important question. Who was asking whether there are any signs? There were any signs about immunity? And another question of Schwachmann Diamond, which I think is interesting. Um, maybe we should talk a little bit about it. So can you answer the question about the autoimmunity? Um, this patient had hypothyroidism and other features. Were these autoimmune mediated or not? Right. Um, not that I am aware of that it was definitively proved, but she does have things that potentially could be related to autoimmunity, like you suggested with the hypothyroidism, maybe even her focal segmental glomerulosclerosis. Um, but I'm, I'm not sure about if we have actual thyroid antibodies that I've seen. The, there was also a question about anti-neutrophil antibodies, since a neutropenia resolved by uh, age three. Do you know it whether is. neutrophil antibodies were ever tested? So just to help out Anu, I think this patient was mm -hmm. came to us pretty initially seen by in folks in Emory University, but I think for a long time was also in other institutions. So in terms of all these questions are very pertinent. What Of all the symptoms, what are these autoimmune manifestations? Whether it's auto uh, antibodies against neutrophils or antithyroid antibodies. But currently she is on immunoglobulin replacement. We don't have any of those, but because those have been established way before we started seeing her again, so we presume these are autoimmune, but we don't know the answers for those yet. And you also have the skin inflammation, which you can think yeah. about mm -hmm. as uh, either autoimmune or immune dysregulation in a way. 
Right. Yeah, and cool. also the liver liver findings. There is uh, lymphocytic infiltration in the liver, um, and um, so part of that is still considered to be a process containing with lymphohistiocytic infiltrates. Yeah. There were also questions about the uh, immunization. Was she uh, immunized normally, and were antibody responses ever tested in this case? Uh, right. That's and then. Alps and T cell repertoire. Um, so, in regards to vaccination, she did get vaccines, but it seems like only to inactivated vaccines. Live vaccines were held because it was known that she was uh, lymphopenic with some kind of issue from early on. We did have some uh, antibody responses, but again, the ones that we have were taken when she was already on IVIG, so I don't know how useful they are, but she did mount responses to them. But again, on IVIG when they were taken. I think it's it was also quite interesting. Uh, sorry. Uh, I don't know whether the question is uh, just to make sure that there were no B cells. Apparently, looking at CD19, there was a virtual lack of B cells. Okay, uh, an interesting. Uh, I see that some people are already. Let's see if it is the right conclusion. Go ahead, Anu. Okay. So key points in our history are that she had extreme failure to thrive, although she does have potential for growth. She's a 14-year-old with a bone age of five. She did have recurrent infections, but obviously nothing that was life-threatening. She has chronic GI losses and intestinal failure of unknown origin. She has an unspecified rash. And lastly, she has a diagnosis of Schwachmann diamond that is autosomal recessive, but she only has one SBDS mutation, and she doesn't have all the underlying causes like skeletal abnormalities that would explain the typical manifestations of this disease. So in regards to her lab, she is hypogammaglobulinemic and lipopenic with near absent B and naive T cells with a predominance of memory cells. So there was an interesting point raised about CTLA-4. Um, um, uh, Dr. Gigi, do you want to comment on that? Like, with, yeah, with, I mean, do you think this... Yeah, that would be an unusual presentation for CTLA-4 deficiency. Those patients don't really lack B cells. Uh, they okay. have more autoimmunity as a clinical science of presentation. We, we don't have a formal evidence of autoimmunity here. And uh, uh, I, 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 yeah, there are T cell infiltrates. So clearly, there is some T cell uh, immune dysregulation going on. But I would not think that this is typical for CTLA-4 deficiency. T7A has been also uh, now postulated. This is an interesting idea because of the uh, GI involvement. And we do know now that patients with T7A deficiency may have a relatively broad uh, spectrum of presentations. However, again, uh, some of the features don't really fit. Um, those patients tend to be hypogammaglobulinemic. They tend to have lymphopenia. But um, you know uh, the other the other features of presentation and neutropenia is not uh, common in T7A deficiency, uh, so I wouldn't uh, really consider that. CHH, the short stature, is clearly you know in keeping with that. But again, we do not have any skeletal abnormalities. It, it is exceedingly rare to see a lack of skeletal abnormalities in patients with CHH. Stat 5B, interesting talk because again in the setting of immune dysregulation. Once again, those patients do not have lack of B cells. Um, so, you know, let's see. Anybody has a, a there was LRB? I think, I think Milu can continue with the Milu same discussion. Um, Immunoosseous dystrophy, um, uh, will that also, like considering the short stature, immune deficiency, um, will you put that in the CHH spectrum similar to others? versus you will consider that as a strong possibility in this case. Absolutely. No, I think I think it's a good idea. There is no question that CHH, um, I mean, should be considered because of the extreme short stature here. You know, I have to say that personally, I am puzzled by the fact that this patient did have one mutation in the Schwachmann diamond gene. And uh, it would be interesting to know exactly what mutation this was. Uh, because some of the phenotype is consistent with Schwachmann diamond. Uh, what is not consistent is that the neutropenia resolved by H3, but uh, you know the low um, low stature, the um, the GI involvement, the uh, the neutropenia, and the presence of one mutation Schwachmann diamond gene 
may you think, you know, could make you think, well, does it have anything to do with the phenotype? Uh, but virtually I... all patients from Akvan Diamond have uh, on one allele always the same mutation. There is one mutation that is extremely common in Schwack van Diamond, and the second allele is, can be So it would be important to know what mutation was present there, and because analysis are done typically at the DNA level, it could be that there was a mutation also on the other allele and wasn't looked for, so it would be interesting actually to do uh, an mRNA analysis here uh, just to make sure that uh, only one allele is not expressed, so the other one uh, could carry a regulatory uh, mutation. But again, what is not consistent with Schwachmann diamond is the total lack of B cells, the extreme naive T cell lymphopenia. These are, this is something we do not see in Schwachmann diamond. And just to add to that, um, so the pancreatic insufficiency that was initially thought was present, we think in retrospect is because it's based on fecal uh, elastase measurements, and she always had diarrhea. So looking back, we really don't have solid evidence for pancreatic insufficiency. And along the same lines, even the skeletal malformations, she has a bone age of 5 for a 14-year-old, So, but there is no obvious dysplasia. So even for somatic manifestations of Swashman diamond, there is not everything fitting. The neutropenia is resolved. There is not other cytopenia coming up. And obviously, the immune deficiency is never this profound in Swashman diamond. Um, and in Johns Hopkins, I think they also did Western blot for this, uh, um, like uh, mRNA level analysis and also deletion duplication. They couldn't find any second hit. So, Excellent. Uh, Excellent. Yeah. Sean, there were also a couple of questions uh, for you and Anu. Uh, yeah, one about um, other forms of neutropenia. Uh, did you do any genetic testing? There was one question about GC GCPXC3. Um, um, again, uh, the question is coming back here. Um, another one about WIM. Um, did you do any uh, additional genetic studies, or were your were your studies targeted uh, specifically to Schwachmann diamond only? I think the initial phenotype was deceiving in a way that everything like short stature, presumed pancreatic insufficient neutropenia sort of fit in the clinical triad. So people were more focused on SDS, and the SDS single gene came back positive and she carried this diagnosis for a long time. But uh, in terms of pursuing for G6PC3, I think uh, in terms of her bone marrow, there are never any neutrophil abnormality or maturation errors noted, and the neutrophil neutropenia resolved. So she carried this diagnosis, but she never had findings consistent with any of the real severe neutropenia, severe congenital neutropenia forms or been tried. Any developmental delay? No, she is very appropriate. Um, one thing for the G6PC3, I think uh, it's a, uh, uh, I also thought of it in passing. She also has dilated veins on the periphery, but most of them are due to multiple clots associated with the central line that she had had, but not congenitally with any vascular uh, cutaneous malformation that we see with G6PC3. Uh, but yeah, those are really good thoughts in terms of the differential, yeah. And, and then I there were a couple of questions about, uh, well, one question about T cell repertoire. I'm not sure that this was investigated. There was one question, well, one hypothesis, this could be a leaky skid or omen syndrome, which is an interesting mm -hmm. thought. I should say, yeah. you know, comment about omen, and then I'll let you, I'll let you and Anna speak. But, you know, typically we don't see uh, omen syndrome in uh, in subjects that are as old as this one. Omen syndrome is a diagnosis that you make in the first weeks of months of life. You don't really make this diagnosis later in life. But definitely, you know, the skin rash is something that can be seen in patients with, you know, RAG deficiency. Uh, most of the omens are mutated in RAG. And a related question was about T-cell repertoire. So did you look at T-cell repertoire or not? So I think that's the testing that's pending. We have, uh, we wanted to look at both T-cell repertoire and also a full B-cell panel, but though there is hardly any B-cells to look at what type of, uh, is, where are we stuck in terms of B-cell, is it transitional, is there any class switch? But she, um, those are testing that is ongoing. We don't have answers yet, uh, but I think we are slightly running out of time. We might need to go to the genetics. I really want uh, Dr. Gigi to start on the spectrum of the disease once we discuss the final diagnosis. So let's proceed to the next slide. Sorry. 
Okay, so her final diagnosis is RAG, C low, B minus, NK positive skit. Two different pathogenetic variants were of RAG1 were identified and whole exome sequencing. Her mother was also sequenced and had one mutation. So just as a quick review, RAG is critical in T and B cell development and is specifically involved in BDJ rearrangement and creating a diverse repertoire of T and B cells. One thing that has been seen is phenotypic diversity with various RAG1 mutations. Some people have three infections, while others have more autoimmunity and hyperinflammation. So Dr. Gigi's group has studied specific RAG mutations and found that recombination activity can be variable based on the mutation and that the severity of the phenotype can be correlated with the degree of uh, recombination activity present. So if we look at this diagram, this was a great figure that was just recently put out by Dr. Gigi's group published this month that depicts what we just uh, we're talking about and also incorporates that other factors such as the environment can uh, impact the phenotype. And um, I don't know if Dr. Gigi has more to say yes. specifically you can, you diagram. One slide. You can you go back one slide? I know. Just one, one point I want to make. Mm -hmm. uh, move it back one. Yes. So uh, uh, sure. uh, these patients carry uh, two distinct mutations. I should say the second mutation as a mistake should be uh, 323 C2T resulting in arginine 108 to stop codon. So both mutations are actually at the very five prime of the, of the gene and of the protein. So you would imagine that these two mutations should be uh, both null alleles resulting in no protein expression. That is not the case because RAG1 has actually several downstream in-frame ATG. So what happens in patients that have exactly those mutations is that they produce a, a tr an ant I mean, an N-terminal truncated form of the protein that maintains partial recombination activity. And so the, the first mutation in particular, the deletion of the uh, two adenine nucleotides, position 256, 257, has been seen in many patients with Omen syndrome. Again, one of you actually postulated that this could be Omen syndrome. I wouldn't call it Omen syndrome, it doesn't have all of the features of Omen syndrome, but it is interesting that patients that have that mutation quite often have skin abnormality, skin rash, uh, they do have oligoclonal T cells. They typically lack B cells. And so I would say that this phenotype is consistent with the presence of reduced uh, but residual uh, recombination activity. If you go to the next one, um, I think it gives you, next slide, it gives you uh, the sense how, in fact, the phenotype of RAG deficiency is variable and what determines the variability of the phenotype. So on top, you have actually the genotype that determines the recombination activity. So the lower the recombination activity, the more likely it is that you have deficiency. The higher the recombination activity, the more likely it is that you present with immune dysregulation. But on, uh, and of course, I mean, in both cases, you have problems with T and B cell development, especially the B cell development tends to be affected. And that, if you have some recombination activity um, maintained, uh, nonetheless, you have problems with um, uh, T cell and B cell homeostasis and to immune tolerance. And so you are uh, impaired in recognizing non-self antigens, but you also uh, tend to uh, um, have a problem in recognizing uh, and, and, and tolerize self antigens. And so you tend to have oligoclonal T cells that attack your, um, uh, the rest of the body. You have antibody production that results in immune dysregulation. On top of this, you have environmental factors and keep in mind that EBV-driven lymphoproliferation is something that may happen, especially if you are more immunodeficiency prone. So interesting case, I would say the typical features of RAG deficiency in this case were mostly the lack of the B cells, the very few naive T cells, uh, but there are several features that were not typical for RAG deficiency, in particular progressive hypogamma globulinemia. This patient initially had normal immunoglobulin levels, went on to have very low immunoglobulins. Whenever you have a patient with very low B cells, very few naive T cells, always think of RAG deficiency as a possibility, even if the phenotype is not a typical no. skid phenotype. I think those are really excellent points made by um, Professor Gigi. So I just wanted to put one other quick question before we move on to our second case. Um, in terms of management, I know um, she's a young teenager and with a lot of comorbidities. 
Um, and what features would make you um, to think about active transplant versus she has gone along 14 years. Uh, what is the risk versus benefit of doing a transplant at this point or waiting and watching this patient? Like, for from our aspect, we are planning to proceed to transplant, but again, we would like to hear your perspective for both the audience and also for management of this patient. So I would agree. I would agree that this patient has to be considered for transplantation. Um, I mean, she's at a point where she has, she does have chronic uh, EBV viremia. Um, she has uh, a markedly abnormal uh, TNB cell compartment. Uh, I do definitely agree that uh, the, the presence of EBV poses significant risks uh, for her future. So I would uh, strongly advocate for transplant. What you want to uh, to do in this case is to use the, uh, the best match donor. Uh, I would be worried to proceed with a haploid identical transplant in this situation. You will need to use conditioning uh, because yeah. this patient has residual T cell immunity. And, and, and we do know that NK cells from these patients, by the way, are abnormal and um, hypercytotoxic. So you, you would need to uh, intervene and condition the patient. But yes, I would definitely search for a donor uh, otherwise, the future may be very, very difficult, very problematic for this patient. Okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Gigi. Um, let's, this has been an awesome discussion. Let's move on to another interesting case, and I think David Hagen would take over from here and uh, moderate the session. We can share it. That's you. fine. <laughs> so if we can change uh, slides, that will be okay. And Dr. Chong uh, will be presenting the next case. I think he's with us, um, so please go ahead whenever you're ready. Hey, Sean, thank you. Thank you, hi everyone. Um, I'd like to thank you, CIS, uh, with partnership in uh, LASID for this opportunity to show our patients. Um, we are present uh, a case of EBV infection, chronic or recurrent. So, it's a male boy with 12 years old Caucasian with intermittent fever, fatigue, sore throat, and diffuse abdominal pain during the last four months. Persistent neutropenia starting 12 to uh, 2012. Uh, he had four admissions for fever of unknown origin less than four years. Uh, in physical exam, uh, his weight is 19% and height in 50% and bone mass index uh, is 40, temperature is 36.2, heart rate is 107 and respiratory rate 22 per minute and blood pressure is normal. He is in a compromised clinical condition, cutaneous and mucous pallor, abnormal S3 and obesity, no lymphadenopathies or epispermomegaly in physical exam. In the past medical history, uh, at eight years old, he had mid-hypothermia. We have five meat criteria for hemophagocytic lymphohistocytosis. Uh, she she pre represents a fever, splenomegaly, cytopenia, anemia, and hypoglycemia, and hyperglycerides. We had a positive IgM for Epstein by virus in 2012. In quantitative PCR with uh, 142 viral EBV copies in microliters. He was treated by a hematology team with dexamethasone and aciclovir and became asymptomatic and normalized in neutrophils counting and remained asymptomatic for three years. In the family history and immunization, uh, he has no similar case in the family. He had a sister, a younger sister, and parents are not consanguineous and vaccination up to date with no complications. Laboratory investigations. Uh, he had a model being 9.2, MCV 77, and platelets 
178,000 cells per microliter. Low cost uh, was 18990 cells per microliter, and nitrofuels was 1%, 17 cells per microliter. Lymphocytes for uh, uh, 540% and monocytes for 5%. Normal liver function tests and positive to rubella IgG in March in this year. We had the EBV VCA IgM equal 43.2. Uh, it's high for the method. And EBV and Ebina IgG equal 8.1 in general in this year. And negative IgM for EBV in March this, in this year. And uh, ultrasonography, abdominal ultrasonography show liver steatosis and homogeneous and splenomegaly with uh, 16 centimeters. In laboratory investigation, uh, immunoglobulins, antibodies, uh, in general, in this year, we had IgM IgG uh, elevated. In March, in this year, we had uh, both IgA, IgM, IgG increased. IgA is normal, and uh, in, in immunophenotyping uh, lymphocytes in general, we had a CD4 uh, lower, and in B cells lower two and any car cell uh, lower two. In March in this year, he had just uh, B cells uh, equal to zero. Uh, was that repeated lab... again after that, or was that the only time? Did you check it again later on to see if it uh, recovered, or did it no, no, the no. only time that we have? Oh, we, we don't have any, any exam now. Mm -hmm. Okay. And another lab investigation we have HIV negative and bone marrow uh, immunophenotyping uh, showed about 35% precursor cells of myelide lineage, intensity altered pattern of neutrophil maturations. And maturation arising from myelostis and myelostis. In biopsy, he had a uh, This biopsy uh, was made in uh, 2012, and this bone marrow monophenotype in 2015, right? In biopsy, he was neutrophil head blood cells inside the neutrophils, mean hemophagocytosis. Yellow dysplasia. Yellow dysplasia was described as a presence of a abnormal genelectis and dysertopoietic chains. In summary, uh, we have a patient with recurrent fever, neutropenia, frequent EBV detection, hemophagocytic lymph histocytosis hypergammaglobulinomia and low B-cell counts. So maybe we can stop here for a second and see what people think about this case and if they have any suggestion or questions. I think ATATU was brought up and um, that's something that we also had in mind. Any other suggestion? I think there was a question about whether this kid got rituximab for EBV. Uh, one of the audience brought that up. Um, I saw apiclovir and steroids. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, no rituximab treatment. Is that right, uh, Dr. Chung? No. No rituximab. Okay. Um, we can't really hear you, Condino, so do you want to try... Um, maybe log off and log on again, log in again. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. Thank you. Uh, sorry. Um, I, I was having some problems with the connection. Well, in this case, I have uh, discussed with um, Dr. Shong, and um, looks like this 
kid has a long-term problem with uh, EBV infection and hemophagocytic oh, yeah. syndrome, uh, the problem is that uh, this is persisting and uh, the team at their hospital, they do not have an accurate uh, diagnosis uh, for this child. So that the treatment is apparently um, confused. Shong uh, brought this case uh, so that people can bring uh, some opinions uh, in order first, in my opinion, to clear this diagnosis. If we don't have a diagnosis, we do not have a treatment for this child. So if this is um, hemophagocytic syndrome and there are two available protocols to use, but first, we have to characterize it um, by giving a um, genetic uh, diagnosis, something like that. So the point with which uh, I think it is important here is to discuss the diagnosis. So what people think this child has. Can I move back a few slides? Um, can I, maybe we can start with that, with this uh, slide. Yeah. Um, this one. Uh, do you think that the, this kid fulfilled criteria for HLH or is uh, solid enough to say that he had uh, HLH? Yes. I mean, the ferritin level is elevated, but it's not sky high. Um, and I don't know if that's uh, if you feel that that's enough to make the diagnosis of HLH in this case. Uh, the second question I had is about um, the EBV viremia and the positive antibodies. If that's, if that's something that you consider as positive, a PCR of 142 copies uh, or not? It's not particularly bad, right? Yeah. No. So my, I guess my question is if we don't have the strong criteria for HLH and we say, okay, maybe as some antibodies against EBV, which can be elevated also with non-specific act activation of the immune system. Um, are we dealing with some form of uh, primary HLH, or do we have another problem of mostly neutropenia, uh, B cell lymphopenia, maybe CD4 lymphopenia, or, or something else in the spectrum of bone marrow failure and not uh, HLH spectrum? You know, what, what, this is Gigi. Can I ask a question? So just to remain on the HLH and to be sure, you know, that this is or is not HLH, number one, um, how were uh, coagulation tests? Were they always normal? And number two, was um, NK cell function ever tested in this case? Like uh, CD107A, the degranulation of NK cells or perforin expression? As far as uh, uh, strong informed, the um, NK cell counts, we have um, two counts. If you go back uh, to the slides, you are going to see a result there. So there is uh, one count in January and one count in March, but there is yeah, no but NK function or perforin test available. So, so you really need a function to to know uh, more about primary HLH. And what about coags? Were they always normal? What was the question, Gigi? Coagulation, coagulation tests. Coagulation. Not Do you have any information? Okay, all right. So, so I would say, you know, in, in any case like this, it would be nice to have NK cell function tests because in one way or another, either you have low perforin or you have abnormal CD107A expression, and that actually is diagnostic. I mean, those two are diagnostic of HLH, either a perforin deficiency or any of the other forms of primary HLH. I think Dr. Gigi is making a very valid point. Uh, the one thing that we've um, seen in HLH um, 
The CD-107 has been really specific for all the degramination defects, including for uh, MONK, XTX-11, XTX, PP2, RAB, and uh, LIST. So uh, another thing for a patient with recurrent HLH, um, most of this if they are like real null allele mutations, but some of them, especially XTX-11, are known to have recurrent HLH with self-remitting forms. XTX DP2 can have some atypical presentations with more CVID, colitis, and other things going on. But, um, and I wasn't sure whether in this spectrum will you also consider ITK, uh, X-Men 1. Um, so, yeah, I just thought I'll just bring these two points for discussion. Yeah, absolutely. All good points. What do you think, uh, Shani, in that regard about the age of onset and severity of ABV infection? Would you expect early, earlier onset or more severe infection, especially with MACT1 and maybe perforin unless it's hypomorphic? Yeah, we expect the, the early disease, but the, I think it's a, a different presentation of the disease. But the level of ABV viremia is not particularly impressive. So I wonder whether were there any other uh, tests done for viremia were any values higher than what you know has been shown? Because that's a relatively low ABV viremia. No, this is just this one. Um, and Sean, as a hematologist, would you uh, would like to comment about the bone marrow biopsy? Is that the maturation or rest? Is that something typical for uh, HLH? So in HLH, I think um, one thing, uh, just to get across the point, the bone marrow, we typically do bone marrow to see for HLH. Not all patients with HLH have hemophagocytosis. Uh, mm -hmm. Maybe two-thirds will have it, but if you keep doing it, maybe most of the patients, we might end up picking it. So... Finding or not finding hemophagocytosis should not rule in or rule out a hemophagocytic syndrome. But the main things to look out, I think we don't see a single lineage RS. That is slightly atypical. Seeing a neutrophil maturation RS sort of, it's not a classical HLH, will not, uh, until unless there is an autoimmune phenomena going in causing some early neutrophil autoantibodies. I don't know. I've never seen something like this. And also looking at the, Pancytopenia. This kid has profound neutropenia, but monocytes, platelets uh, are okay, uh, hemoglobin is okay. Until unless we say that it's chronic inflammation and inflammatory underlying auto-inflammatory disorder or underlying inflammatory disorder, going into HLH where we can only have relative pancytopenia rather than absolute cytopenia. These things don't add up to a classical HLH, but again, HLH, whether you label it HLH or not, or you want to label it a hyperinflammation evolving to an HLH, I think it's semantics at this point. In terms of management, we still need something for hyperinflammation. Uh, I think ruling out an underlying hyperinflammatory disorder like systemic JA or something more I think need to be worked out. I don't know whether autoimmunity would explain some neutropenia because that profound neutropenia without neutrophil, without platelets dropping is relatively odd. Uh, uh, again, uh, um, and doct I don't know what Dr. Candila and uh, Dr. Gigi uh, think. Candila, you go. Um, so I was answering here uh, about um, some kind of chronic infection. Well, we have to go uh, to this case and see that the bone marrow was checked and there was no um, fungal or leishmania infection in this patient. And, and as well, um, as I discussed with Sean, this patient had no other uh, viral infections of any other type. And it was checked for HIV is negative. And um, it is uh, quite uh, striking for me that the, um, the myeloid series, uh, you have a problem on neutrophil uh, differentiation. So um, 
it's a little bit mysterious. No, uh, I, I honest, uh, honestly, I I can make here several uh, diagnostic possibilities, but this is uh, one of those cases that don't read the books. <laughs> so I cannot fit. Yeah, and this is frequent here in in Brazil and South America. We have several cases that don't read the books. So this patient has. Um, kind of um, EBV infection is not that impressive as it is described in the literature for hemophagocytic syndromes, does not have um, severe hemophagocytic syndrome, apparently has no other uh, endemic uh, or tropical diseases. And um, I don't know, I don't know if this is a new disease. It's quite strange. But in the setting of um, hypergam, like in chronic small ring HLH, we tend to see B cell wasting. A third of them can have later B lymphopenia, can develop hypergam over time if the HLH is small ring or recurrent. Uh, seeing him have hypergam makes me think, is there something still... Uh, inflammatory, underlying inflammatory disorder is still driving it rather than a primary cytotoxic T cell defect or an cell cytotoxic defect leading to primary HLH. Again, looking at hypergam, recurrent HLH, EBV that is not too impressive, uh, and the pancytopenia in the setting is not very profound. Uh, everything gets back to are we missing an underlying inflammatory disorder that presence with some shades of macrophage activation rather than the, your classical ICU admission, full-fledged HLH from your uh, typical uh, cytotoxic T cell defect primary HLH. Yeah, I would agree with Sean and, you know, I would be very nervous to proceed with transplant, uh, especially because although although a lot has been done to rule out infections, I'm still not totally convinced that this is driven by some infection. Well, whether this is the chronic EBV or something else, I don't know. Um, but I would transplant. Yes, uh, from my perspective, I would never give a transplant to this boy because we do not have the diagnosis. I always tell the students that doctors will make correct therapeutic options when they know the diagnosis. So first the diagnosis after the treatment. And, and we what do you not think about the option of GATA2? Somebody already mentioned that, and I think you also mentioned that. Uh, what, as we do not have the, the diagnosis, so we can only uh, make the right decisions on treatment of this boy once we have the diagnosis. and. Uh, I would never go for a bone marrow transplant in this boy because we do not have the diagnosis. What is this disease? So GATA2 could be tested. I mean, um, it's relatively straightforward. So I, I think it should be tested. Mm -hmm. I mean, just to be on the safe side, I would do also the NK cell studies just to be absolutely sure. Yes, the NK cell, I know a guy uh, in my department that can help. He's a neighbor that I have. Um, his name is Alexandre Barbuto. He works uh, with cancer immunology, and uh, I know he has uh, NK uh, available tests for humans. I Tomorrow I can ask around and see if they can help with this. And uh, as well as, uh, as say, the perforin, uh because this is important for um, HLH uh, diagnosis. We have to do the, the perforin. And um, what we can also do here, we can try an exome. This we can run. But other available uh, functional tests, uh, do you guys have any other suggestions? So Gigi suggested the NK. Uh, we will work on this and try to do this test. And other flows. I think CD107A, if possible, would be very helpful. Um, it will rule out potentially six or seven disorders if it doesn't come back normal. Uh, so Condition, along with MK, perforin. Continue, if you have, we can do the CD107A if it is not available. Mm -hmm. 
or in your neighbor's lab. Okay, um, then uh, and we, we can do Gata too. Gata too. Gata. Everybody offers something. We can sequence that. Yeah, the Gata too. Yeah, and uh, uh, perhaps I had a problem here. What did do you guys think about the Gata too in this case? Because uh, this called my attention uh, because of the uh, myeloid series uh, alterations. So that's why uh, occurred me to think about Gata two. Any of those crazy variants on Gata two? What do Gata you two. think about this? Gata two is on a differential diagnosis of any presentation. So why not here? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what what do you do you do you <laughs> One bone marrow finding in GATA2 that might be slightly suggestive is they have very dysplastic, unique looking uh, micro megakaryocytes, and yes. they look like osteoclasts, multiple small nuclei. So you can ask a hematopathologist to see if they are seeing shapes of that. Um, that is a clue. The one other thing is he has this profound monocytosis, though the classical book is monocytopenia. In the last two patients where we have seen when there is an ongoing some form of atypical mycobacterial infection, there is not a monocyte opinion. They still have monocytosis even in GATA2 patients. I don't know if Dr. Gigi or Dr. Um, Condon has found similar observations. And we do have patients who we thought were HLH but turned out to be GATA2 because they had underlying mycobacteria that was driving possibly this interferon gamma-driven pathophysiology causing cytopenia, chronic inflammation, ferritin that was high, could fill for the criteria of HLH, but eventually the underlying problem was the disseminated mycobacteria. Yeah. That's a good point. Um, what do you think of the combination of no B cells and elevated IgG? Do you think it's the same infection that... Uh, wiped out the B cells and at the same time push plasma cells to produce a lot of uh, immunoglobulins? Well, uh, this is another thing. When, as Gigi comment, um, GATA2 may be possible in any differential diagnosis as well as giving immunoglobulins to a primary immunodeficient patients may also help. So we can, we can try. Uh, actually, about um, the antibodies, um, we can go deeper and test better in more detail antibody function in this patient. How uh, can he manage uh, an antibody response and bring this information as well? There's, an interesting, now, there's an interesting you, comment from Clinton Zerbi that, you know, could this be a data 2 syndrome? Yeah, ADA2, yeah, I, I just read here. Yes, uh, why not? Oh. Okay. I think we need to wrap up, right, David? Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Yep. I think thank you very much for our presenters and our mentors. Um, these are great cases, and I learned, personally learned a lot, so I hope uh, you did too. Um, so send, uh, stay tuned, and we will send an invitation for the next uh, webinar session. Any so other one other thing I want to... Add would like his David or Joy if they want to present. We do have interesting cases for the next several months. I don't think we hear you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hello, are we still on? Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, perfect. So, again, I think we're done. And one thing, if I heard you correctly, we want to thank uh, Kate Sullivan who started this project, and we're just uh, continuing her uh, initi initiative. So, uh, we need to thank her too. Um, so, yeah, thank you very much, Paul, and, and yeah. good night, I think. Thank you. Bye bye, Thank everybody. You, everybody. Bye bye. Thank you, Thank bye -bye. you Dr. Bye -bye. G. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye bye.